Today, the Commission is publishing a discussion paper on the implementation of international obligations by Ireland. And what this does is that it describes Ireland's interaction with the international community and with international law over the last hundred years since the state was established. Now, the discussion paper is a little bit different from uh, what the Commission ordinarily publishes, which would be a document containing proposals for reform. This discussion paper is primarily descriptive in terms of looking at the state's treaty practice, how it actually approaches the issue of signing and then ratifying international agreements, and then how those agreements become part of Irish law. And I suppose one of the things we're trying to do in this report, or this discussion paper, as you correctly call it, is to move kind of on from the narrow discourse on dualism and its limits within a common law jurisdiction. We're trying to look at, in a sense, other ways in which international law can impact in the domestic sphere. Uh, international law that isn't just confined to international human rights law. And even though we deal in some detail with the question of dualism and the relationship between the Irish constitution and international law and international obligations. I think we don't see that as the be all and end all of the discourse. The idea is to expand the discourse so that we can look, you know, and evaluate 100 years of engagement with the international system by this state uh, and not just assess it as a cost benefit analysis of some sort based solely on something that is generally problematized as dualism, but in fact, it, it oughtn't to be like that. It's simply the system that we use to deal with international law and international obligations. And as we will discuss later, that can also be viewed as an enabling provision in the constitution as much as, as a, an insuperable obstacle to use the phrase that has sometimes been used to characterize it. So maybe to get our discussion going, Ray, you might kind of give us the historical context for all of this from the Free State and indeed prior to the Free State up to the, the era of COVID, which we now sadly live in. Yes, thanks, Donica. I should have introduced uh, Donica O'Connell, Professor of Law, who shared with me uh, the coordinating commissioner role um, with uh, the other members of the commission uh, on this project on international law. And you're absolutely right, Donica, that really we're talking about 100 years. It is just over 100 years since uh, Ireland sent its, sent its first representatives on the international stage to the Versailles Peace Conference. And really, uh, I think right from the beginning, Ireland saw the international community and engagement at the international level as a very important part of sovereignty uh, and how we showed our independence. Um, and I think right from that beginning, when uh, we were a dominion of the British Commonwealth, as it became known later, um, there was a question mark over how much and how far you could go in terms of international relations. But I think Ireland as a state, right from the beginning, pushed the boundaries of, of that, even within the relative confines of being a dominion. Uh, and very early on, there were issues around whether Ireland could be represented separately at international conventions. So that was pushed in the early 1920s. We were um, eager to become members of the League of Nations and did that. And um, so from that point of view, the participation of the state in international institutions right from the beginning was a very important part of uh, our um, development as a state. And all the way through the 20th century in particular, including uh, being uh, initial founding member states of the Council of Europe, and Donica, I think we'll talk about that a little bit again, um, membership of the UN from the 1950s, um, after we'd applied in 1946 for membership straight away after the UN was founded, all the way through to today, that participation at international level, including this year earlier, uh, successfully achieving the fourth opportunity to sit uh, as a non-permanent member of the uh, Security Council of the UN um, and our engagement at international level as a neutral state 
in peacekeeping operations uh, mandated by the UN Security Council. These have all been very important aspects of how the state has participated as a member of the international community. And as you've just mentioned, uh, Donica, I, I suppose um, uh, we may not always be thinking about our membership of all the international organizations that we're members of. But again, even before we were a member of the UN, we became members in 1946 of the World Health Organization. Um, and so that indicated very clearly uh, participation. Uh, and obviously this year in particular, uh, with COVID-19 pandemic uh, responses, we very much participated along with the WHO in implementing as best we can the policies and procedures that are set out and agreed by the almost 200 members of the WHO, the international health regulations that the WHO has developed, and then also working very closely with the European uh, uh, Prevention and Disease Control Centre. So from that point of view, that engagement at international level is quite important to the, the state, and that has been the case for those hundred years uh, of active engagement in the international community. Yeah, and I suppose if you look at something, say, like the 1937 Constitution, clearly really important uh, and, and of enduring importance in relation to international law. If you look at something like Article 29 of the Constitution, it gives a certain embrace to the generally recognised principles of international law as a guide in our relations with other states, etc. And yet it also creates this a device of dualism for dealing with you know a deeper embrace of international law by providing that no instrument of international law becomes part of domestic law unless determined by the Arachthas, which is you know perfectly valid way of engaging with the international system and certainly a very normal way for a, a common law country uh, to do that and one of the things that I think we've done in this paper and that, that is actually done quite carefully in the paper is to not see it as, you know, some kind of analysis of international law good, domestic law bad, or even international law, domestic law together, better or whatever. It's rather to see and to look practically at how we engage with the many instruments that we ratify. I mean, we know from 2018, when the commission completed the draft inventory that there's over 1400 international instruments ratified by this state, which at one level is a huge achievement in terms of foreign policy and engagement with the international system uh, for, for a relatively young state. So that's one kind of basic fact. But we also know that the way in which the Irish state does this, like any other state, uh, varies. That you can have full incorporation of an international instrument, even if it's just appended as an appendix to a statute giving effect to that instrument. We know that you can have indirect incorporation like the ECHR Act using the interpretative technique, which is consistent with what was done in the UK, but you know, complicating factors of the Irish constitution as well. We know that there can be implicit forms of incorporation. We know that sometimes it may simply be implicit by reference to what's happening in parliament. And we know that we ratify sometimes without you know, being completely up to the standard required by an international instrument like the UNCRPD, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, as a statement of intent about getting there. That we're, you know, we're serious about getting there. There's a roadmap uh, to ratification, but it's also it's an ongoing journey. That It's not something that ends at the moment of ratification, that it becomes part of a process or part of an evolving process uh, over time. So, we have, you know, we have all of these techniques. We also have the exception. For European Union law, international law would have, and maybe Ray, you want to say a little bit more on this issue of, you know, delays in ratification or delays in incorporation being seen as a problem. I mean, one of the, the reasons that this arises is that we don't ratify and, until our domestic law is at least up to the level required by the international instrument. Now, you could take a view of that, that's a good thing, 
that it means you're taking your obligation seriously. But of course, there is the problem that getting there can take time and that can lead to a degree of criticism about the delay in getting there or the delay in ratifying. Something that came up particularly in the context of the Disability Convention, but which was lessened somewhat by the fact that the EU had actually ratified that convention anyway. So if you could maybe talk a little bit about the EU exception on the dualism uh, rule and this, this question about you know, the, the time involved in achieving ratification or even full incorporation. Yeah, I, th I think that that uh, really is a, a, a big question uh, and a challenge for any state and, and particularly maybe a relatively small state. But I think what we've done in the paper is to describe um, the way in which, for example, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities uh, was uh, signed first. We were one of the first countries to sign the convention and were active participants in the development of the convention. Uh, and then we looked at what we had to do in terms of transforming uh, and engaging in the paradigm shift that was necessary in terms of our legislation. And that really required a lot of work. Now, it, it, of course it can be said, and it was said, that there was a, a delay and a time lag in terms of ratifying the convention. Uh, but I think you're right to say that one of the things that we've identified in the discussion paper is a positive aspect of the fact that the government, after some nudging, uh, published a roadmap to ratification in 2015. And I think that is a very helpful and transparent way and a clear way in which we can identify where we've already implemented the key elements of the uh, Convention on the rights of persons with disabilities and then also where we need to reform our domestic law to really ensure that we're complying with those basic principles of international law the uh, lovely piece of plain latin pacta sunt servanda that the agreement should be implemented once you've signed it in in good faith uh, but that sometimes does take time and i think we recognize that in the paper in terms of a very complex piece of work uh, that has to be done to transform our domestic legislative landscape. Yes, it can be criticised because it takes time, but it also shows a serious commitment which is consistent with our engagement at international level. So there can be some criticisms there, but we certainly identified that particular roadmap as indicating where we need to legislate for, for reform. Um, and I think it was right then that in 2018, even though all that legislation had not been put in place and is still not in place, that we ratify. And that also says we're committed at the international level to acting in good faith to implement those requirements. But it still takes time in terms of the time in the Oireachtas that's needed to, to do that. Um, and I think, again, certainly the programme for government of June 2020 this year uh, shows a serious commitment to engaging in that kind of hard work of legislating in that area. And in quite a different area, then, we also identify another mechanism that can be used. Uh, this is regulatory impact analysis, uh, which is used in the context of other very complex um, international agreements, such as those in the marine and maritime area, on uh, areas such as safety of life at sea, which I think we all appreciate if we're uh, going to Old Trafford by boat, uh, we really appreciate that the kinds of standards that the Irish flag states uh, operate to are those internationally agreed standards. So I think that, that's really important for us to see those as very positive things, but they're also very complex uh, and constantly being updated. Uh, and so the mechanisms that are used there in order to assess how we implement those international safety at sea conventions those are also something that we talk about both in terms of the positive use of regulatory impact analysis and then when you have something very complicated like those maritime and marine conventions that we have to use a combination in our law of primary legislation that's acts of the Oireachtas and then also statutory detailed regulations that we've uh, identified as well in in the paper uh, you mentioned as well and i think it is very important to recognize uh, the uh, impact of European Union membership of Ireland since we joined in 1973. 
Uh, and of course, for international law lawyers and for domestic law lawyers, EU law is a very unique, not very unique, unique piece of international law in that not only does it operate at the international level, but also operates um, with direct effect into our national domestic law. And bearing in mind the range and scope, particularly increasingly in the last 10 years since the Lisbon Treaty came into effect uh, and really transformed the scope of uh, EU law, including in the context of uh, international human rights standards, but also in terms of um, commercial law, uh, international trade law, those kinds of areas, those have really transformed through the EU, our domestic landscape. Um, and I think another aspect of, of that that's very important then is to recognize that uh, even though EU law is part of our law, uh, and therefore to some extent is an exception to the dualist approach, there's still a lot of hard work often to be done in terms of ensuring that we transpose correctly our EU obligations. So we go through the complexity of that. So for example, even when you have something like the General Data Protection Regulation, the uh, famous uh, GDPR, that that has a um, uh, directly applicable effect in our law. In other words, in a sense, once it's agreed at EU level, that becomes part of our law. But we also have to put in place legislation here in Ireland through the Data Protection Act 2018 in order to ensure that all the necessary nitty gritty is put in place as well. So uh, that is very important. And that leads me on to one other aspect of EU law that's very important, I think, and that we discuss in the paper, which is the way in which, in particular, Oireachtas committees have a role in terms of scrutinizing right from the beginning uh, the way in which we approach our general national policy at EU level. And so Oireachtas committees uh, have a very important role there where officials brief uh, the Oireachtas committees uh, at a very early stage of engagement at EU level with some proposal that's coming from the European Commission. And that I think is incredibly important uh, in terms of the way in which that scrutiny act uh, that was enacted um, uh, in our own uh, parliament, how that actually allows very detailed parliamentary scrutiny of EU proposals. And that point about parliamentary scrutiny, it brings us kind of nicely on to the question of enforcement and monitoring of our international obligations. And this is dealt with in some detail in chapter four, uh, the final chapter of the paper. And I suppose what we need to kind of emphasize is that enforcement and monitoring of enforcement takes place at two levels, the international level, and the domestic level. So frequently Ireland is called to account before, for example, UN committees of one sort or another or through the Universal Periodic Review, which we've engaged with twice and will engage with again in, in, in 2021. Um, but also there's a domestic level at which uh, we can measure the impact of our international obligations. And that can be at the level of a court regard for what has been decided internationally. That's just one level and clearly limited somewhat by dualism in circumstances where the international law has not been incorporated into domestic law. But we know, of course, that it's hugely persuasive now in many contexts, especially in relation to instruments like the ECHR. Uh, but also in the political domain, like we see strong evidence now of parliamentary scrutiny of international obligations, uh, frequent references a uh, whether in the context of private members' bills or whether in the context of committee proceedings, especially those Oireachtas committees that deal specifically with international relations, but also some of the justice committees, frequent reference to our international obligations. Uh, and then we have specialist agencies, national human rights institutions, like the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission, uh, a very, very important institution uh, that is working assiduously to promote international standards in the domestic sphere, but also working in the, in the equality sphere where the influence of EU law might in fact be, be more apparent. Um, we know too that the IREC, the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission, doesn't have a, a monopoly on this, that there are other agencies like the Ombudsman or the Ombudsman for Children, 
that have a really uh, important role in using these international standards, typically in the sphere of human rights, within the domestic sphere. And also in the paper, we looked at our own work in the Law Reform Commission that, you know, consistently the Law Reform Commission it uses comparative standards, but it also uses international standards and would have based a lot of its work, especially in areas like assisted uh, decision making uh, on, on instruments like the UNCRPD and indeed in other contexts as well. Uh, and then of course, there's the non-governmental organizations, the, 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 the well-known NGOs like FLAC and ICCL, Amnesty and various other bodies, NWCI, various bodies, that routinely now, there's literally, you know, it's almost part of the language of the NGO community to continuously use international standards as objective benchmarks of what is required of the state. And again, this all occurs in a context that isn't simply defined by the use to which international standards can be put in an Irish court. They occur in all sorts of contexts, civil society at its best, whether engaging with the parliamentary system, engaging directly with the executive, or indeed engaging in litigation. So one of the things I think that we hope for this paper, it's not a report of the Law Reform Commission, so it doesn't have a list of recommendations at the end and a draft bill. That's normally what the Law Reform Commission does, although it has in other areas like bail or whatever in the past done papers that, that are, are more in the nature of a discussion paper. And one of the things that the Commission can claim for this paper, and this paper read with the draft inventory published two years ago, it's a very significant contribution by the Commission to the discourse on international law in the domestic sphere. And although the Commission has always used international law, it's probably a first for the Commission to do something that's explicitly on that subject. But it provides essentially a baseline study for others to use. So we would, I think, like to believe that this paper is of use to people working in the policy domain in government. Uh, it's very certainly of use to members of the Dáil and the Shannad in their work as legislators and parliamentarians. Uh, it should be of use to jurists who are interested in international law, interested in the persuasive authority of international law, interested in it as part of all of the sources that they draw from it certainly should be of interest to academics. And I strongly suspect it will be of interest to activists who in a sense can use the information that's carefully put together in this discussion paper, coupled with the hard information in the inventory as an authoritative basis on which to build their own advocacy, their own work, drawing on the international system. Um, it's no more than that. It's not making any kind of great claim. It's simply saying that this is a contribution that allows the discourse to be broadened, perhaps to be deepened, and to move on from the narrower framework of analysis, which I think has focused unduly on dualism as a problem, as opposed to dualism as something that enables greater engagement with the international system through our democratic process. OK, and, and certainly, Donica, on, on that note, I think we can uh, certainly finish. But I wanted to just say uh, thank you to all of the people who assisted the Commission in the development of uh, the uh, both the draft inventory that, as you say, was published in 2018 and very much based on the Irish Treaty Series uh, that is held and maintained by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. And we've had very good engagement with the department on this, as we have with uh, all of the other uh, individuals and organizations who are mentioned in the acknowledgements page in the discussion paper uh, and the researchers uh, who assisted us in the development uh, of uh, the two outputs from this particular project. So uh, on that basis, I completely agree with you that I hope uh, what we've done will be of assistance uh, and will be uh, helpful in a practical way to those who have an interest in international law.